Hello, everybody. It's Thursday, December 17th, and this is the first Josephine Tay Symposium assembled by the Poison Pen. And it really, I give Sujata Massey, who's one of the um, four participants, credit for this idea because when we were talking about, well, no, when we were talking to you and Nev March, you and I stayed on afterward, and somehow we both acknowledged how much we liked Josephine Tay. And then Dana arrived and she's a big Josephine Tay fan and bought a bunch of Josephine Tay. And then I thought, oh, that'd be wonderful. The three of us could talk. And then I read the singing sands and realized we needed Val because there were some Scottish words in there. I absolutely could not. <laughs> herpling, Val, tell me what herpling means. I just love that as a verb. It means sort of, it means limping basically. Um, oh, okay, because I mean, here we have Alan Grant herpling along in the highlands, and I was trying to envision what, what he was up to. It's the kind of it's the kind of limping that you do that looks a bit like Scottish country dancing, <laughs> and of course, Scottish country dancing often leads to herpling, especially if you're dancing with somebody who's not very good. I love it. <laughs> So um, each of us has particular books we want to talk about, but I thought I would throw out a general question and I'm going to give credit to I, Marty Wingate with whom I did um, an event last week for pointing out, and I thought it was interesting that Josephine Tay was not at all afraid to have Alan Grant um, handicapped, not, not in like the alcohol way or the broken marriage way, but in The Daughter of Time, he's in a hospital bed, a subject that Dana will talk about. So he's doing the whole investigation while basically trapped in bed. And in The Singing Stands, which Val and I hope to talk about, he is suffering from PTSD, but really intense claustrophobia, which bothers him and which he discusses quite candidly. So each of you has some thoughts about why Tay was so, um, willing to, to put him out there as a basically fragile and flawed human being? I think, she, I think she's interested in, in the idea of um, damage and also the idea of how people deal with that in their lives. Uh, she had, you know, like she lived through the, the First World War and it's quite clear that she lost someone who was very close to her in the First World War. Um, a, another writer, a, a poet, that was a, he was a very good friend of hers. Um, there's some suggestion that there may have been a, a romance there, but I'm not convinced by that at all. However, she she carried that damage forward with her. It probably happened when she was at um, college. So she was at the other end of the country from her family support. Uh, so she went through that kind of experience. And she was a writer who very much brought her own experience to her work. And I think that's where her interest in that lay. So, Gosh. Um... I think that she didn't want to make him the star. Like I noticed that in so many of the books I read that these characters were so enchanting and, and so diverting and you put a lot of emphasis into the, the characters um, or my attention went to the characters. So I, you know, I think that just those were the kind of stories that she wanted to tell that were about a lot of people that were had women in the forefront many times, you know, the complexity and the hidden power of women. So it was good to have him, you know, be the law, but not everything be focused on him. And she wasn't afraid of um, letting her female characters be smarter than he was. I'm thinking in particular of Erica Burgoyne in A Shilling for Candles, that young girl who's probably one of my, she may be my absolute favorite Tay character. Barbara just reread the book here at my instigation and um, had forgotten how enchanting Erica Burgoyne is. And she's smarter than everybody else in the entire book and basically solves the mystery for Grant. And so that Grant doesn't wind up with egg on his face or at least too much. Um, I find that enchanting. You know, an interesting thing about that is, is that I was worried all the way through that she was like a child in jeopardy, but it turned out that she was the most nope. <laughs> bulletproof person in the entire book. She was so interesting as a child. Val, you were going to say something, sorry. Uh, and I was, I was going to say that also the character of Marta Hallard, uh, who is the, the actress who is in anybody else's novel would be Alan Grant's love interest. 
but the two of them have an entirely platonic relationship. And she, as a, in, in true actress form, steals the scene time and time again. Uh, when, when she comes in, when she enters the room, that's where your focus turns, exactly as you're saying, Sujata. A woman enters the scene and Tay gives her you know, front and centre. So the other major question that I think each of you is probably going to want to talk about in talking about your books is, is the question of reputation. You know, it seems today in our social media and, you know, shock and click world and all that reputation hardly seems to matter anymore, although maybe the U.S. election just slightly put it back. Um, but but Tay seems, it, it, you know, people, crimes are committed and people are really committed to reputation. I think in the book, certainly the franchise affair is a classic example, um, but also in Miss Pym, which Val's going to talk about. So, who would like to who would like to start, or should I just appoint somebody? Let's appoint Let's appoint Sujata to talk about the franchise affair, and Dana wants to weigh in on that one too. Okay, sure. Um, I'll I'll talk about that. I, this might actually be the franchise affair, the first of the Tay books that I read, and I haven't read them all. I'll admit that to you now. And I'm glad that I have this experience of reading some of them for the first time and then rereading this book. And so The Franchise Affair is a, is a special book because um, you don't, Alan Grant is such a minor character in the book. The person who acts as a sleuth, the narrator is a solicitor. And his name is Robert um, Blair. And he's just a very small town solicitor, but very proper and from you know a well-off family. And he sort of is in a midlife crisis. You learn in the first few pages that he started to wonder, is this all there is in life that I'm gonna live in my comfortable house with my dear aunt Lynn taking care of me because I never married and getting to stop work at 345 after that last mail has come and go and play some golf. And so he gets a phone call one day from, you know, a lady that he doesn't know, but he's, he knows her by sight, um, Marion Sharp. And she says that she and her mother have been accused of this terrible crime, which is that, um, they have kidnapped a young girl, kept her in their house and um, beaten her before she escaped. And so it's a, it's like a, 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 you know, a crazy accusation and how could this possibly be pulled off? And I see this as a novel, you know, where it's not, there's no trick to it really. Like it's more of a suspense novel where we're alerted early on because of the the look. It, there, there are things that this young accused woman who's 15 years old does with her eyes that make everyone believe that she is, you know, in something, that there's something dirty about it and that she's playing a trick and that for some reason she wants to use, she, she needs to have an alibi. So she's going to use the, these ladies and accuse them of a crime so that she can go back to her home and people will think she's okay. Oh, there's so much going on. I don't wanna to talk too much about the actual plot of the book. Um, I think it's interesting that reading it now with the 2020 hindsight, we look at everybody is so outraged about this young woman who, has a, who, who says that she had been kidnapped and beaten and said, you know, what kind of an amoral girl was this that she was out? And, you know, now we would think so many, we would think, yes, it's completely believable that a girl was kept somewhere. It's, it's completely believable too, that somebody of that age that was 15, um, a war orphan who was being kept in a foster home had, you know, difficulties at that age and might have looked elsewhere for attention. There are all these things that I think would make her an incredibly sympathetic character. This book would have been written in a really different way today, um, but it was written at the end, it was written right after a big war and it was written at a time that um, the council housing and rights of the poor people were just coming to the forefront you know, that the, this building was going on of these ugly houses that people like Josephine Tay probably disapproved of. 
So this novel is sort of about staking a foothold for the old Britain and really examining what are the rights of the working class and should somebody who had a deprived childhood be allowed to get away with crimes. Um, so that's just the start of it. I don't want to say any more. I'm eager to hear what, what Dana and Val think about this. Val, you're going to wait? <laughs> when you go, Dana, I'll follow you. Well, I um, actually chose this book for my book club next month because I've been thinking a lot about the franchise affair um, over the past year. Um, and I just read a story yesterday in the news media about the mayor of Kansas who resigned her position because she had the gall to impose a mask mandate and she's been threatened and her family's been threatened and she's, she's in fear for her safety and the safety of her family. And I'm, I'm, it's amazing to me how many people you can convince of a lie. But, but it, it's, I mean, and it was like that in 1951 when Tay wrote this book, and I'm sure it's been like that down through the ages, but it seems emblematic how fragile a reputation can be if you can trash it so completely and totally. I mean, at the end of the franchise affair, it's, we're, this is, we're gonna spoil, right? I mean, I can spoil. I mean, at the end of the franchise affair, the, the citizenry has been so motivated against these two alleged in, um, perpetrators that the community rises up and burns down their house. Um, and it just, it seems much of a muchness with what is going on today, much of it driven today by social media. So Sujata, you, I think you're entirely right that this would be a completely different book today, especially as to the means that were used to trash someone's reputation. Yeah, it, it, it's true that uh, the reputation of the two women is entirely trashed without social media. We think yeah. this is an invention of uh, the, the Donald Trump administration, fake news. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, fake news has been around for a very long time. And that, that uh, mechanism of convincing people uh, that somebody else is other, is alien, is, is an outsider, and is the kind of terrible person who would do this appalling thing to a, a, a young woman. Uh, and of course, it's 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 very cleverly constructed and I think it's something that crime writers find fascinating the franchise affair and certainly um, Sarah Waters drew on it for The Little Stranger and freely admits that she drew on it when she was writing The Little Stranger and I, I suppose there's been a lot of um, a lot of novels written about this idea of, of, of keeping people prisoner uh, you know at one end of the spectrum you've got Emma Donoghue's Room uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum I suppose you've got the franchise affair which is what appears to be this kind of, of thing, but, but in fact, of course, isn't. And I think it's something that, that we all find interesting, this notion of you know, keeping someone prisoner. And of course, it goes right back to fairy stories. Uh, and so it, it's got that sort of yeah. mythic power almost that we all immediately uh, hook into because it's been there since our childhood, this notion of, of keeping someone a prisoner. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. It's also and, uh, if there's not, you know, if there's not direct evidentiary, um, very concrete things, it's it's easier to create suspense. And you know, when it becomes like a swearing match as opposed to something much more concrete, um, that's why reputation can be so slippery because oftentimes there is no actual evidentiary stuff. You know, it's. He all said, rumor said, and innuendo. And rumor and all. And, and I was saying, Val, earlier when we, when we were talking um, before you came on, that um, I called the bookstore the poison pen because I've always thought that poison pen letters, as certainly appears in at least one Agatha Christie and doubtless in others, um, was so vicious. You know, I mean, it ran gossip all around a community, whether it was a village or whatever it was, and did terrible damage. And But that it also was... I used to think it was potent because people cared about their reputation, but today I'm not sure that I feel the same way. Do people really defend their reputations? Is that really your best asset, you know, as a person, as a professional, as a business person? Um, as a person, as a, as a writer, and I'll bet you anything, Sujata and Val can um, attest to this as well. Any publisher will tell you any publicity is good publicity. So, you know, if you get bad publicity, you just roll with it. You're the nine day wonder. And 
move on. Honestly, I don't think reputation is what it was, what it used to be. Is the value not, is valued as it should, as it once was. I'm not sure about that. I think it's, it's, reputation is one of those things that you only value once it's gone. Maybe. Um, you know, and, and I, I can think of several cases in recent years where um, writers have behaved in such a way that they've been kind of publicly disgraced and people have, people still remember it. They don't get invited to festivals. They don't get included in the, the, the community of, of crime writers, which is generally a very friendly and open and welcoming community. But there are some, once you make certain transgressions in terms of reputation, um, then you're dead in the water. Do the readers remember it? Well, they don't sell books the way they used to. Yeah. It's a very slippery subject, I think. And, you know, certainly as a business person, reputation is valuable. And, you know, there are people who actually want to weaponize bad review, you know, not only bad reviews of books, but bad reviews of business. You know, people who um, threaten you with, you know, Yelp or they take a complaint and so forth. And then you have algorithms deciding, you know, whether the really bad review should come above the good reviews and how many stars they award you and all it's I think it's still really with us yeah Jada, I think that the book might very well be written and read differently today but on the other hand since we're talking about it you know it obviously is it was Val is this the book that the CWA voted was the best mystery of all time no they went for the daughter of time that was it I knew it was a Tay book I, I wasn't sure which the franchise of Fair made it into the top 100, but uh, it was the Daughter of Time that was, was voted at the tops. Well, you've done a natural lead in there for Dana. So Dana, why don't we talk about but, You know, okay, I want to talk about this book because I love this book. This book was, my mother was a huge crime fiction fan. She read all Christie, Sayers, Marsh, all of them. And I mean, you know, you're a kid and you're a professional against her and you decide, no, I'm not going to read the same thing my mom does. So it took her like 20, 22 years to get, force me finally to read a crime fiction novel. And it was The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay. I mean, it completely turned my reading world on its access. But I got to tell you guys, I'm not, I can't say with conviction that The Daughter of Time is a better book than The Franchise Affair. The Franchise Affair is the book that haunts me of all Tay's books. They're all good. I, I, I believe, but the, the franchise affair is the one that haunts me. The Daughter of Time, I love because it stands so many crime fiction, uh, crime fiction conventions on its head. And also because she opens with an indictment of crime fiction as it is being written. All of those titles, I am certain that the, the fictitious writers that she's writing, you're laughing, Val, I know you know what I'm talking about. The, all of those writers that she's talking about, that he's, all the books that are on his, that have been brought to him as gifts to ease him through his, you know, uh, convalescence. He doesn't want to read any of them. He knows exactly what they're about. They're exactly about the same thing that the last 10 books that that writer wrote about. He's just, you know, it's just an utter and complete indictment. And I mean, it, it's no wonder she never joined the crime club. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, she, and then she stood all the, you know, I mean, the daughter of time begins with Alan Grant flat on his bed, in, flat on his back in a hospital bed. And he works out, teases out the, the solution to a crime that was committed 400 years before. There's no forensic evidence. There's no reliable narrators of, um, of the time because, you know, naturally nobody's going to write anything that Henry VII is not going to approve of. Um, it's just, I love The Daughter of Time because it was my introduction into crime fiction that I went on and read a whole bunch of other crime fiction that was not at all like The Daughter of Time. And it took a long time for me to realize just what she had done. It's, it's the ultimate cold case, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is. And I think it's a particularly apposite novel for people to be reading at the moment, because here we are in the throes of COVID, many of us in varying stages of lockdown. And essentially, at one time or another over the last, uh, the last nine months, I have found myself effectively in the position of Alan Grant. <laughs> I can't go and do any research outside the house. 
I can't go and interview people because I'm not allowed to mix with people. Um, and I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here plonked down in front of my desk uh, and, and that's it. That's my resources. I mean, obviously, I have the Internet at, at my fingertips, but that's not always much use to you when you're researching a cold case. Uh, and so I think that uh, a lot of people will find echoes in this book right now of, of where they are in terms of, you know, being cast back on your own resources. So, Jana, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just thinking that it's a really pleasurable thing to try to find a solution to an unsolved crime. Um, you know, like recently I had that conversation with Nev March about her new book, um, Murder in Old Bombay, which is about a true crime. I've been fascinated by that crime for like six years. And so it's like unsolved, you know, just weird things that you th that that history says it's one thing but there's evidence to show that maybe the the written accounts are wrong you know that's something that we all want to do or or a lot of us like you know my son is obsessed with the truth about michael jackson you know, like we think we know the truth about Michael Jackson, but he, you know, likes the conspiracy theories. And and um, so I just think that it, she taps into a very human instinct with this book. Yeah. Well, and Colin, Colin Dexter just, I mean, ripped off the whole idea with the, with the When She's Dead, where he has Inspector Morse in the hospital bed solving a historic crime. Um, and, and that's mm -hmm. a sense, I mean, it's, it's a straight lift from Josephine Tay. So it's, you know, any idea, if you let it sit around long enough, somebody will pick it up and run with it as if it's their own idea. Well, I think we should also remember, you know, historically speaking, she, she didn't accept Shakespeare as the definitive portrait of Richard III, but she actually started a whole school of Ricardians people, or at least she tapped into them, whether she didn't start them or not. Elizabeth Peters wrote, you know, a follow-on book, III. but basically um, there was a whole re rehabilitating, you know, Richard III thing that, um, that took light. And I, I wonder, I haven't really paid that much attention, but since they spaded him up, you know, in the parking lot or whatever it is, haven't they, you know, Val, what, what's been the effect, you know, maybe you're closer to it than we are. Is it confirm Shakespeare or is it confirm Josephine Tay? Well, I think the, the, there's more of a sense of leading towards the, the Tay view of things. Uh, people do understand now that, 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 that you know, that this is a case where very much history was written by the victors um, and the people who needed their version of it to be accepted as the truth. Uh, I, and I think certainly there was no sense when, uh, when Richard III's body was discovered in the car park in Leicester there was no sense of uh, this should be treated as a, a disgraced object. Uh, it was, you know, like there was sort of big discussions about where it should be reburied, reinterred, as a, as a monarch, and not as a villain. Well, if we really go with Qui Bono, I think that Henry the Seventh had the clearest motive for disposing of potential claimants to his throne. So I've always thought that you know Richard really didn't have that much to gain, and in fact, his whole theory of kingship rested on the idea that these kids were illegitimate. So you know, it was Henry Tudor also from an illegitimate side, so to speak. Another that, thing, another thing that she does in um, *The Daughter of Time* is she the way uh, Tay applies the um, skills of a detective, an experienced detective to historical evidence, if we can call it that. Um, I also thought that that was very well um, done because he reads um, uh, Thomas More, he reads Sir Thomas More's account and doesn't think until the end of it to look and see how old Thomas More was when he wrote that book. And there, if there's one thing that a cop loves, it's, you know, secondhand evidence. And I, I just, and it's, so it's just, that's the, I, that's like the, the turning point of the momentum of the entire novel. And I love the notion of applying tried and true detective skills to history, because I've read enough history now to where I think that Tay is absolutely right and that all historians are mad <laughs> because some of the things you will read in historical accounts of things, you just, you don't really seriously do not know how the writers of those things got there <laughs> because it makes absolutely no human common sense as in Qui Bono. Well, one of the pleasures, I think, of, of uh, the Hilary Mantel trilogy 
is uh, Mantel's take on Thomas More as being a very long way from the sainted Thomas More, the man for all seasons. Um, a sort of certainly some historical re revisionism going on there as well to paint a, a different picture that, as you say, uh, Dana, is much more in accordance with, with the facts, the situation, and makes more sense of the situation than the, the received version handed down by the people in charge. Mm -hmm. I can only hope I'm able to live 10 more years to see what is going to be written about both your prime minister and our president, because I think, I think it's going to be fascinating. Right. So, Sujana, yeah. um, we've talked about two books with Alan Grant, but let's talk about Brad Farr for a minute, because I think I have this right of eight of eight, the eight mysteries that Tay published three, or maybe it's only two don't have Alan Grant in them. It's Brad Farr and Miss Kim. Right. Yeah. Um, and Brat Farrer is interesting. Actually, it sh I should be saying Farrer because she kept saying mm -hmm. that there is a line in there that it's like Farrell, but the person misspelled the end of the word. So I'm going to try to remember to say Brat Farrer because I think that's what I think that's what she intended. Um, so it, it, how it would be pronounced. I thought it was Farrar in, in English. Yeah. What? Wait, how would you pronounce F-A-R-R-E-L in England then? But you're Farrell and Farrer. Farrer, okay. Farrer. 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 Farrer, but you'd say F-A-R-R-E-L-L -E -L -L is Farrell. Okay, Okay. so it's Brad Farrer is what you're saying would be the Farrer? British pronunciation? Farrer. 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 Okay, all right, well. Two short A's. Okay. I spent 68 years pronouncing it Farrar, Val. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so um, the, well, what, one thing that's, that's, that's significant, and I'm really glad that I got these two books, this book came out the year after Franchise Affair. So it's sort of like I'm continuing along in her, um, you know, whatever her creative process was. And um, this book is much sunnier than um, the franchise affair. You know, it opens in this beautiful, you know, um, kind of a manor house um, kitchen where people are having a meal together and there are all these wonderful children, um, you know, children between the ages of nine and 20, and they have a guardian um, called B. And I was, the, the book felt to me a lot like a, juvenile book and I don't mean for little kids I mean like for teen readers and I had read a lot of British fiction written during this period that was for you know a good reader somebody between the ages of 12 and you know 16 or 17 and there was something about the characterizations in this book and this world that made me think that she wanted to go into that zone herself and, you know, in fact that, so there's this, this blissful family and they're about to celebrate the um, coming of age of the eldest son. And the reason that they, that these Ashby children live with their guardian aunt B is that both of their parents died in an aeroplane accident eight years previous. And so I did all this thinking that, okay, so the book was, was actually, she may have started the book in 1947. So we're talking about this accident being in 1939. I believe the accident happened before World War II. And the reason I'm, I'm focused on this is um, when Brat, Brat Farrer, who is this, you know, pretend, pretender to the family fortune, you know, he's, he's brought into the scene and he's actually only 21 years old. And we learned that eight years, when he was 13, he stowed away on a ship to France and then he stowed away to the United States. And, and, and some readers have, have pointed out that this would be absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous in World War II for like a child to be able to do all the stowing away. Um, but if it was 39, you know, at least he could get one place and it, it, it is conceivable that he could have stowed away. So, um, you know, as far as those things, I, I wanted to get that clear in my mind. And this book really is, I feel like it's an escape from the wartime horrors. It's almost like a bride's head revisited or something, you know, it just, um, this 
wonderful that they, they run everything so beautifully at the home. And there was a nearby mansion, which was owned by um, relatives, but it fell, you know, they couldn't maintain it. I think it was the Leadenham family that I think are distantly related to the Ashby family. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. And they had sold their school, their, their home to become a progressive boarding school, which is roundly mocked by everybody, um, <laughs> you know, because the children are led to learn as they want. And, um, you know, it was just like a little bit, I don't think Josephine Tate appreciated that. So it's, it's a story where the, most of the characters are just very, very, very good. And that makes me feel like this book is um, younger, you know, that, that she, was, she was putting herself in this very kind of like a, a sweet state of mind. I think it's interesting. It seems to me that there's a love triangle in this book. Um, and the ending was, was a little bit strange to me. And if to the love triangle, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit that was complicated is when the interloper who was Brat Farrer comes to live with this family, he is, he, he says that, oh, I'm the twin brother that everybody thought died. I've just been away and I came home. And so now I'm ready to take hold of my um, inheritance and be part of the family. And because he looks like the surviving twin brother of, the, you know, the, who is called Simon, who is 20 turning 21, uh, and he knows a lot of details that he's been coached on, just like the girl in Franchise Affair was coached on details. Um, so Brat is accepted. People believe that he's Pat. Um, one of the challenges is there is a sister who's just a little bit younger than Simon, the sister of Simon, Eleanor, um, who is 18, and I think she turns 19 in the book. She is attracted to this guy and she falls in love with him, though there isn't a whole lot of action between them at all, but the attraction is explained. And then she thinks, how can I be attracted to my um, brother? which is what it, what it would be. But I had the feeling the whole time, whenever I heard about feelings of love, it was Brat feeling this way toward B. And I don't know how old B was. I was trying to figure out so, you know, so desperately how much older is B? Like, is she 33? He's 21. She's 33. What, what is going on with that? And um, there's a, there is a hint at the end that, you know, B feels the same way and is interested in luring him away to a new life. So I'm going to stop there. I'm curious what you think about Brat Farrer. I, I think it's, it's interesting the way that you, you talk about the, the love triangle relationship. And in a way, I think Tay is very clever about that because um, there's, there's, it's been well documented over the years that uh, people who don't know siblings are their siblings if they've been separated for whatever reason and they come together as adults, they very often fall in love with each other because they feel that bond, that connection, and they have no other explanation for it other than I am in love with you. And it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that's, that is recognized. And I think that she plays with that and plays with our ideas about that in, in the book. And I, I think, I love, I love what you're saying there, Sujata, about this, this beautiful, uh, happy family sitting around the table, everything's going swimmingly. And essentially, um, Brat Farrer arrives and it's like a bomb going off in this family. And the sort of shards of this explosion cut into all the relationships within the family until nobody really knows what they can trust about their, themselves and their emotions because nobody knows whether they can trust Brat Farrer or not. And I think she does it, I think she does those complicated relationships really beautifully and the way that things fragment and at the end there's the possibility of something coming together I love yes, and, you know I love the fact that she plays the two classic kind of trope one the country house setting you know which is 
so British and so, you know, Americans maybe love it more than British people read it. I don't know. But, you know, so she has the country house city, which as you say, she then drops a bomb into it. But I really miss the lost air plot. You know, I mean, it's unfortunately to me, uh, although it's fortunate in many ways, now that we have DNA testing and all this wonderful plot has largely vanished. I mean, Bleak yeah. House, forget it. You know, you can't do that. Mary Stewart wrote, was it the ivy tree? Is that, I think that's her lost ear um, story. I'm almost sure it is. And, you know, and Brad, um, I'm not even going to say his last name. <laughs> but, but here comes Brad, you know, and, and again, you know, we, it's, it's difficult to have really specific evidence. He's been coached, as, as Sujata points out, and, you know, he knows enough to, to make it plausible, but it, there's no really concrete thing that we can grasp, you know? So um, I love the way she just kind of throws it in there and blows things up. And, and I miss that plot. Dana, do you have a thought? I, I mostly, when I think about Brad, Fairer. I mean, yes, there is the bomb, the human bomb dropping on this. But I, I, if you take um, all of Tay's books in context, and admittedly, I haven't read some of them more, as recently as I've read others. But if you take all of her books in context, this is the one with the bucolic setting, the rural setting, the, 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 you know, horse country. And I mean, she never, I think she writes scenery better, I think, in Brad Ferrer than she does even in The Singing Sands. Um, and I wonder how much she is hearkening back to that um, imagined, it, I don't even know if it's imagined or if it was real or to be aspired for or what, kind of bucolic um, country house setting. Um, in, and if she was writing more about that than anything else. And then I was thinking about um, Sherlock Holmes and I forget which story, it might be the Speckled Band where, where uh, they're right, he and Holmes are writing, he and um, Watson are writing through the countryside and, and Sherlock says something about how the country homes are, you know, they, they, there are these beautiful houses on the outside and that there are these horrible family secrets lurking on the inside. And I just wonder if that's kind of like a trope of, of British trope and that she was like, you know, doing her usual thing of blowing it up with Brad. I, I think it's, it, it's interesting, as I, I said you know, at the beginning, that uh, she never wasted anything in her own life, and her own experience. Uh, and I think that this book uh, is, is kind of uh, one of the examples of that. Um, she had a very, a very dear friend, a very close friend who was an actress and who was a lesbian. And Tay spent her summer holidays every year with her friend and they would go horse race. They'd go to watch horse racing. Her friend loved the horses, uh, loved going to horse race meetings. And that's what they would spend their summer holiday doing. And it's quite clear that uh, although she grew up in the Scottish Highlands where, uh, frankly, you couldn't get much further away from the English country house, but she was obviously in love with that kind of world as well because she left her money, she left her estate to the National Trust, which looks after the, the stately homes of, of England. Um, she didn't leave it to the National Trust of Scotland, which mostly looks after landscape. Uh, she left it to the National Trust in England. And I think that uh, her success as a playwright with her play, Richard of Bordeaux, which gave her an entree into this world of, of, of the, the highest echelons of theatre, meant that she had experience. She was invited to those kind of houses. Uh, and I think that she, she slightly fell in love with that uh, as, as an ambience. And this is her way of, of, of paying tribute to that ambience. And you're right, Dana, she does write about it with, um, with, with real, real feeling. Yeah. And you get that same um, real feeling for the English landscape into Love and Be Wise. Um, when, when Leslie and, and, and um, Wilf go off on, on, on their fishing trip, uh, their, 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 their hike up to the source of the river, um, you get again that real sense of, of the, the lush beauty of the English countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think she was trapped in Inverness looking after her father and she could only get away for a few weeks every year. And this was what she yearned for. Well, speaking of beautiful writing about beautiful countryside, let's talk about the singing sands because I mean, I think, I think her depiction of the Highlands is absolutely gorgeous. And in fact, this is a book that was published posthumously, right? They found it um, 
I assume it was mostly completed or maybe fully completed. Um, and her paper is when she died. Yes, um, I have I have a, a particularly lovely um, edition of it, the folio. Oh, edition. I've seen that. Ooh, oh wow! Which I'm I jealous. did the introduction for. I was I was lucky enough to be asked to do to do the introduction, which I oh. really enjoyed doing. Um, and I, I think it's a fascinating book, Singing Sands, and it's fascinating because of Grant's role in this book. The actual story isn't, isn't I, I don't think, that particularly terrific in terms of the, the crime story. But um, I think one of the things that uh, always fascinates me about Tay's writing is the way that she writes about identity, about masks. All of her books have this element of people hiding behind a mask, not showing themselves in their true face. Um, and in a way, she does this with the Singing Sands as well. And, and she does it kind of, she does it with Grant. Um, he has, as, as Barbara was saying earlier, he's clearly suffering from PTSD. He's everything in, in his career has caught up with him. He's claustrophobic, he's having panic attacks. And he comes north on the sleeper uh, to the Highlands from, from King's Cross. Uh, and there's, I mean, it opens just it's a wonderful opening paragraph with the train just coming into the station. It's, it's, it's just so evocative and immediately, it's, it's like reading that first paragraph, it's like watching a short film. You can just see it unfolding in your head. And uh, on the train, he finds, uh, uh, they find a dead man. Uh, and Grant becomes obsessed with this dead man who they have, they have difficulty identifying. But he's obsessed with the way this man looks. He's, he keeps talking about his, his tousled black hair and his extraordinary eyebrows. And he's just completely obsessed with this man on the train. And, and it is about how he looks. Um, and then he goes off to stay with his, his cousin uh, and they have a, a, a stocking estate in the Highlands and he's just shooting and fishing, mostly fishing. Um, he's got a nephew who is a fabulous wow. character. Patrick, fabulous Patrick. character. What a lovely kid uh, who is just absolutely devoted to his uncle and follows him around at his heels. And Alan essentially is, is, wants to just look quiet and walk in the hills and go fishing. And then uh, the, the character of Zoe, Lady Kentallan, arrives, She's a young nice. widow, um, attractive widow, heiress, a couple of young sons. Um, you would think the perfect match for Grant. And they go fishing one afternoon and, and he describes her um, as having... Um, from behind, she looked like an adolescent boy. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then, and then he says she was one of the few women he had ever met who looked good in trousers. Right. And she's going like, hello, what's going on here? <laughs> and, and he convinces himself in the course of this afternoon that he really ought to marry her uh, and that this is someone he could settle down with and be happy with and, and everything would be marvellous and it would help him put himself together again. But a few days later, he suddenly he realizes that the person who is occupying all his thoughts is not Zoe Kentallan, but it's the young man on the train with the astonishing eyebrows and the tousled hair. And so Grant becomes obsessed with the story of this young man. Who is he? Where did he come from? And that's where we, we come to the Singing Sands and this takes him on a, a trip to the Hebrides um, before he discovers that it's actually nothing to do with the Hebrides or the Scottish Islands. And there's a completely different explanation for the, the Singing Sands, this cryptic note left on a newspaper in the pocket. So in a, in a sense, almost the mystery, the, the, the crime, the mystery is, is incidental. Um, and what becomes at the heart of this book is questions about Grant himself. Who is he? What are the masks he has been wearing throughout the novels we have come to know him in? Uh, and I think, I, I say in this introduction, and, I, and I, I genuinely believe that Josephine Tay is a kind of bridge between the golden age and the modern uh, age. It's, uh, she, was, she was really concerned with issues of identity, issues of gender, issues of sexuality, but it's always just out the corner of your eye. She never writes about these things in, in a way that is vulgar or, or um, in any way uh, going to frighten the horses. But it's all there in the subtext. Mm -hmm. It's the twitch of a curtain, the closing of a door. Uh, and, and there it is laid out before you. Miss Pym Disposes does precisely this. To Love and Be Wise does precisely this. Mm -hmm. And 
she she's she's writing essentially the the the, the seeds of the psychological thrillers. I I, I think personally that uh, Patricia Highsmith would not have written the way she did had she not read Tay. I think Ruth Rendell would not have started off writing the way she did had she not read Tay. Uh, and I think she she is that she's the missing link, if you like, between the right writers like Allingham and Christie and and writers like Highsmith and, and Rendell. And, and, I, and that's the thing I love when I go back to her books, I see those relationships and I see those, those half caught moments. Uh, she, was, she was someone who, who lived her own life behind masks. Um, you know, she, she, was, she was Beth McIntosh in Inverness, the daughter of the greengrocer. Uh, and when she went to London, she was Gordon Daviot, the playwright, or Josephine Tay, the mystery writer. She never gave interviews uh, she had, she had this. I mean, I, I, I have this. Lo I love this vision. She would get on the train at Inverness, you know, in her tweed skirts and her, her twin sets, and be the, the perfectly uh, turned out uh, Highland lady. And when she got off the train at Euston, she would go to the Furriers, where her London wardrobe was kept in storage and where her furs were kept in storage, and she would be transformed into this woman about town who spent her days in the theatre with actors going out to, to beautiful restaurants and, and having a lovely time. It's just completely different. Her, 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 in, her London friends never once visited her in Inverness. They never came north to see her. She would go to London every, every year. And that last year of her life, when she knew she was terminally ill, and she wouldn't see any of her friends, and she wouldn't see anybody from Inverness. She stayed with her sister, who lived in the home counties. And I, one of the things that I, I always sort of think is, um, in that last year, she knew she was dying, and she had the perfect opportunity to destroy any of her papers that would give us a real clue to who she was and what her actual life, her private life was, who she loved, who she hated, what drove her, all of those wonderful things that I would lo I long to know. And she took them, she, she, I, I'm sure that she was having these regular little bonfires in her sister's back <laughs> garden, you know. And I have this, I have this fantasy, um, you know, that uh, of one day I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in the Highlands and I'll, I'll go to an auction room and uh, there'll be this sort of battered old desk in the corner and I'll take a fancy to it and I'll get it home and there'll be a secret drawer and in the secret drawer there'll be a Josephine Tay manuscript or letters or something that will finally unlock for me the mystery that, that's at the heart of Josephine Tay herself that runs like a thread through all the books. That's Sarah Jane and Cassandra Austin. Uh -huh. Isn't it maddening when this kind of thing happens? Or even, even Sir Richard Francis Burton, you know, his very Victorian wife, burned so much of his stuff, you know, and it's just heartbreaking when you think about it. Do you know what I loved in the singing stands? For one thing, I think, you know, the plot really does come wingy like H. Ryder Haggard out of left field, you know, so I don't think that there's really much chance that the reader can ever get to the solution of what happened to the man on the train on his or her own, but that's okay. It wasn't a fair play mystery to begin with. But I, I, there were two things I really loved, aside from the child, from, from the redheaded kid. Uh, he's wonderful. I loved the scenes in the little airplanes. I loved, you know, the idea of, of this early flying, you know, that, that was great. But what I also loved is even though he thinks about Zoe for a brief moment as a matrimonial, he seems oblivious to the fact that his cousin has engineered the whole thing. You know, I mean, he just completely misses that. My favorite scene in that entire book is when he and Zoe are fishing by the river and the friend, the friend shows up and all of a sudden, Grant really could give a hoot about Zoe. He just wants her to get the hell out of the way so we can talk to the friend and find out about the guy on the train. Yeah. I have always thought that the guy on the train, the mystery of the guy on the train was what brought him back to his original life, brought him all the way back to yeah. health. He was, you know, never gonna get married and settle down. That's not who Grant is. It's almost as if the murder plot is a device to get from 
where Grant is at the moment back to what he originally was to go off and, you know, whatever the next book was and solve the next Oh, book. I think you're absolutely right, Dana. And I also think that, is it, what's the name of the guy? Is it Wee Willie or, you know, the, the dreadful Scottish oh, character? Oh, Scottish, but yeah. Right. But I mean, you know, it is an interesting psychological in the sense that that guy is the is the final clue that lets Grant figure out what, you know, what happened to the man on the train. So, I mean, it's a, you know, it's sort of detection by character. I mean, he reads this character and then he applies it to another character and that well, allows him to get to the solution. About, you could say that about, if not all, most of our books, it's all detection by character. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, certainly true in the daughter of time. Of detection by character. Right. She's a master class in it. She Mr. really Lindus is. Poses is all about detection by character. Mm -hmm. um, it is. But, uh, yeah, um, I think that's, that's exactly right. I was going to say something, but it's gone. Carry on talking. <laughs> I want to say something. Um, you know, Val, I'm just so captivated that you know this information that she would go to the furrier and change her clothes and become this other person. And when I listen to that, I keep thinking about Marta Hallard. And I wonder if Marta was sort of like an, an alter ego for her. And um, I'm curious how many of the books Marta was part of those books and the meaning, the meaning of this character. I think she's, she's, is she in the singing sands? She's not in the singing sands, is she? Not no. Um, she, but I think, I think she's, she's in the she's, 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 she's in both of these, A Shilling for Candles and To Love and Be Wise. Uh, uh, not not of time. Of time. She's, not she of she time. gets sure. the whole thing running when yeah, she's, she's, the, the she's the prime mover. Uh, yeah. And she's in to love, yeah, to love and Be Wise. Um, and yeah, she's in, I think she's in all but one of the Grant novels. Mm -hmm. um, at least mentioned. And her character develops because in the first book, she's not that, she's, you, I, I remember going, I think I had read, I read that book, whatever the first one was that she appeared in. And I thought, well, that, or I think it's um, To Love and Be Wise, actually. And she's not the most admirable person. Whereas in The Daughter of Time, you can understand why she and Grant are friends. Mm. At least that was my take right. on it. Yes. Now, have you read the Nicola Upson books at all? I have read a couple of them. Well, I'm not, I'm not a big, sorry, Nicola, I'm not a big fan until I got to the penultimate one, which I've given a copy to Dana to study, which is Josephine in Cambridge in 1939, just as the war is coming along. But I wonder, because we were, we were talking earlier in our first get together um, about why there isn't really a, a sound autobiography, uh, autobiography, a sound biography, or at least a biography that I have read of Tay. There may yeah, be just biography. one. There is, there is a biography um, now. Uh, by uh, Jennifer Morag Henderson, um, which came out a few years ago uh, and was, um, she was given some assistance by um, just members of the family who uh, have some, some had some uh, early uh, early work that had been published, short stories and, and poetry and things. Um, I, I it's, it's it's very thoroughly researched, and I disagree quite profoundly with some of her conclusions. But it is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a well-researched piece of work. Barbara, uh, tell just tell uh, Val about the Catherine Aird. Right. Um, well, I I was um, years ago. We were submitted um, a biography of Josephine Tay, written by Catherine Aird, who, as you probably know, her maiden name is Macintosh, and I'm not sure if they were related or not. Right. And it didn't. We, it didn't go forward. It was much more a um, a factual. You know, it was more like a chronology than it was a biography of really penetrating. You know and um, character analysis and so forth. But I wondered, you know, if in her way, Upson thinks she is writing a kind of biography. I, of I, think, I think that Nicola Upson did research Tay. I think she knows a whole lot about her. Um, I think that I've, I read something that, that first she has really just done so much research on Tay. And I, I enjoy those books, the Nicola Upson books. Um, and in those books, there is a romantic relationship uh, between Marta Hallard and Josephine. 
And it's interesting. There also are other characters. Alan Grant seems to be someone who's interested in Josephine, but Josephine doesn't want to have a relationship with him. And also Alan Grant has these cousins that are in the theater business and they are referred to in other books by name and like they're, they're costumers. And so they appear in these books too. So I, I mean, I, I enjoy them. Some of the plots, like there were a, really, there's a few that are very, very dark that um, sort of like go into things that we don't often see in the traditional mystery, um, such as incest. Um, but overall, the whole, you know, the I, I think that it's really interesting. If you're a Tay fan, I think that people should at least pick up one of these books by Nicola Upson to read. Well, if you I, 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 have general, I have a general issue in principle with uh, uh, taking real people and uh, turning them into fiction. Um, I, I, you know, why not just make somebody up? Um, well, I'm sure it's a marketing thing. We've had, Dana and I have had that discussion with a different author whom I won't name. Um, but um, yeah, but I, I just, you know, sometimes fiction, sometimes, you know, fiction can get at, at a character in a way that, that a real biography or nonfiction does not. And um, I just, you know, I find it fascinating because there is so little that we can read about Tay in our own life. And as you say, the papers are missing a lot of them, or maybe just never existed. Who knows? I just think I, I just think it's um, as I said, I, I, taking liberties with with real characters is is I, it's not something that sits well it's with my me. objection to the Crown on television. I absolutely refuse to watch it. I, mean, I just. I'm not going to do that. So Val, could we wind up for a moment with Miss Pym Disposes, which is actually one of my personal favorite tastes. And I haven't read it in so long. I'm, I'm shaky on it, but Tay herself trained as a, what we would call a gym teacher, but you know, physical training, whatever. And so she uses that setting as she does much of her life experience, you know, for the background to Miss Pym. And again, it's a whole thing like the, I think it's very much like the franchise affair. Um, but you're you're you've you've read it more recently. So what would you say? Oh, I don't know. I had, I had, I had the chance to reread it before this, but I mean, it it is set in in a physical training teaching college, and that was she went to uh, Birmingham uh, to to do this training, and she spent a few years after she graduated teaching, but uh, her career was cut short um, because her mother died. And she had to go back to Inverness to look after her father because she was the unmarried daughter. And so she was expected to do that. Uh, but uh, she, she also, she, while she was teaching, she had an accident when she was teaching in a school in Oban, she had an accident with a beam uh, that fell on her head. And that's exactly the uh, inciting incident she uses in Miss Pym Disposes. And again, this is, this is a, a novel about character. Uh, it's set in this college. Miss Pym is, has written a work of popular psychology and she's an old friend of the principal of the college and she's invited to come and give a talk to the students at the college. And she comes along and uh, the principal of the college has a, a favourite a favorite pupil uh, who is, is uh, awarded a, a particular prize, a scholarship prize that everybody else thinks should have gone to some, another girl. Uh, a much more popular and attractive and talented girl. And it's gone to the rather sort of lumpish, not very attractive one who's the favorite of the principal, who is then the, the, the favorite of the principal is, is, is murdered, is found dead. And the story unfolds around who, who caused this accident, how the accident happened. Uh, and at, at the end, um, I, again, not what to give too much away, um, one of the characters sacrifices herself for the sake of the person who committed the crime, uh, sacrifices herself, I suppose, on the altar of, of love, friendship, however you want to read it. But again, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's cleverly put together. The characters are vivid and, and really credible. You can see the dynamics between those characters and, and 
they feel very authentic. They feel like the kind of things that people really do, the way that people really behave. And Miss Pym, sort of, who, who's like, you know, almost mocking herself, she's there as a psychologist. Uh, and she's like, keeps getting wrong footed because she's misread a situation. Everything. And it's like Sujata was saying earlier about the mockery in Tay. And I think it's there in all her novels. Um, she, she, she does mock all sorts of pretension and uh, sometimes quite savagely. Mm -hmm. uh, she she yes. mocks things that people that she uh, disapproves of. In, in Singing Sands, for example, she is really um, completely, utterly destroys the, the wee Scottish nationalist guy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, Ms. I, I mean, Miss Pimp Disposes has, has um, it also has, it, it lulls you into a false sense of, of security. Again, there's that sense of, of this gentleness going on here. This is this is very English and very calm and, and you know, but what's going on beneath the surface is anything but calm. And it was the first Josephine Tay novel that I ever read. I bought it when I was a student at Oxford in Jeremy's 10p bookshop on the Cowley Road, which is where I purchased a vast number of, of crime novels over those years. <laughs> And I read this, and it was quite unlike anything I had read before because of this engagement with, with, with the characters. Well, I think you're right. It's a very high smith, and I mean, it's certainly not a conventional mystery in, in any sense. Um, and she was great at wielding the rapier rather than the broadsword. You know, she was, you have to really pay attention. Um, she's, she's very quiet, very subtle, but I think all of her books, you know, none of them really falls into any direct classification they're yeah. all they're all special they're all different you know um i think that's always, probably yeah. why we why she we love them testing so. herself she was mm -hmm. always testing herself she was always trying something new how yeah. what can i get away with this time at least that's my feeling in reading the books right but now so you should write you should write the autobiography <laughs> huh? no, I, 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 that's far too much like hard work no. um, <laughs> Well, but it, it's it's interesting that, that you know she is still um, hugely admired among crime writers. You know, whenever uh, whenever she comes up at uh, St Hilda's when we have our, our St Hilda's Crime Weekend, I mean, it's, it's, Andrew Taylor and I practically come to blows about who's going to be allowed to talk about her. That's a very good point. And I just I just I've been I I did a little googling before uh, we met, and I found a, a profile of Josephine Tay in Vanity Fair in 2015. I yeah. mean, there's still she's still an object of fas fascination. Yeah, and we haven't even talked about you know the the broadcast, but also several of these books have been you know turned into television or film. The franchise affair three different times, I think, and. Um, you know, I, I don't think she wrote a ton of plays and other, you know, verse and other things. But I think the one we remember is Richard of Bordeaux, which got John Gilgood. I'll probably mispronouncing that one. Am I? Oh, no, that was good. <laughs> is it right? Yay. Um, anyway, got him his start and made him so, you know, that was also one of the reasons I think she vaulted into the higher echelons, as you say, of, of London um, theater and society. But, you know... Um, I Val, I just love your story of her being the country lady on her way into town and then very much the city lady when she gets there. Ta I, I, it's so illuminating of everything that she wrote. Yeah. That she was a totally different persona getting off the, the and, train. Oh, God. Know, Val, Val makes it clear that she was also, you know, a prisoner of expectation. She was the unmarried daughter that had to cut things short and go back and take care of her father. You know, she was, um, I mean, I wonder if the way she wrote in part was her attempt to escape all these traditional bonds, you know, that in her, in her writing, in her imagination, she could free herself from, from the conventions that she was being forced to live by, or and felt she had to live by, I don't know, it possibly was self-imposed, I mean. You know. and she, she has characters that refuse proposals, you know, like at the end of the franchise affair, um, you know, that Marion is absolutely sure she doesn't want to take care of this middle aged man that like that is not as exciting a life as going to another country and with B, you know, that at the end of, of the um, the Brat Farrer, she's going to go off to um, Ulster to run her own 
uh, horse, you know, her own horse interests, her own horse farm. And so even though Joseph Josephine would be critical of like a young woman who was sexual and, you know, express it through the, through the opinions of her characters, that kind of criticism, she, if, when she got behind a character that she cared about, she would give that woman freedom and that woman would not do the textbook ending. Yeah. Well, I think this has been a fascinating discussion and I would like to say, I hope it will encourage people to not only reread Josephine Tay, but think about you know applying her to today because I think one of the great things about her is that her books, while you know they are of their time, really work just as well today. Yeah, you know, in, in a, um, and that you know, I mean, I'm very much a part of the British Library crime classics, and some of those books clearly are rooted, you know, in their time and don't update all that well. So you read them as a period piece, and that's fine. But I think with Tay, you can read her in a very modern context, and what she says and what she writes you know, works equally well and can be reinterpreted today. Did you and want to make a final time, comment there, Val? Every time I get off the, the, the sleeper in London, <laughs> I think of Josephine Tay and I have a little smile to myself and I almost wish I had a furrier's to go to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you could probably set that up. <laughs> right, now that you have moved, I love Val. I said to her, we did an earlier conversation that I have known Val for over 30 years. And in the course of 30 years, she has moved steadily northward from <laughs> where we started, you know, from London to Manchester to North and now she's back in Edinburgh. So it's been a, a full circle for you. But yeah. I'm happy to see that Edinburgh really agrees with you. And so here we are, you're in Edinburgh. Dana would normally be in Alaska. Sujata's in Baltimore. I'm here in Scottsdale. And, you know, isn't it wonderful that we have this technology that allows us all to get together and have the great fun of, you know, discussing an author that clearly has meant a lot to all of us. Yeah. So thank you guys. And let me wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And for any of you listening or watching to this, let us wish you very happy holidays as well. Bye.